and thank you uh, for the invitation to speak uh, today. It's really terrific. This is a uh, very, very exciting uh, program, and it's a privilege uh, to be uh, uh, speaking here. So in any case, I will be talking for the next few minutes uh, about some work that has been a uh, uh, passion of my uh, uh, professional life for the last over 20 years, and that has been uh, understanding uh, some of the uh, disorders that present uh, as undiagnosed uh, hereditary fevers uh, in patients, and uh, over the course of time uh, has had really uh, uh, unexpectedly, I think, uh, large uh, implications for our understanding of uh, uh, the regulation of inflammation uh, in man. So in any case, uh, let's uh, get into it. And certainly in terms of our thinking about charting a course uh, for genomic medicine, at least uh, for us, uh, it's been very much uh, a matter of starting uh, with particular patients uh, with particular phenotypes. And so I will just uh, regale you with a few of them uh, over the course of the next minute or two. Uh, first of all, uh, here is a, uh, at the time this image was uh, taken, seven-year-old girl from California who had uh, months-long episodes of fever with severe abdominal pain, a migratory rash, and sometimes arthritis. And you can see here, this is actually a laparoscopic view of her uh, abdominal cavity uh, showing adhesions that had formed as the result of uh, recurrent episodes of inflammation. Here's a toddler from uh, Baltimore uh, who had a different uh, type of recurrent fever syndrome, also uh, hereditary. Uh, and in this case, uh, this patient had weak, long uh, episodes of fever with diarrhea, uh, the skin rash, and cervical lymphadenopathy. This uh, is uh, a kidney biopsy looked at under uh, polarizing light uh, showing amyloid deposition in a young man from Turkey who came to the United States uh, as a graduate student at Georgetown uh, and uh, actually was seen in a uh, screening physical examination uh, with proteinuria and turned out to have amyloid deposits in his kidneys and incidentally had uh, a history of, of a few day episodes of fever uh, intermittently over the course of uh, the first 20 years of his life. Uh, and then here is uh, an audiogram uh, taken from uh, a young woman in her early 20s uh, from Texas uh, with high frequency uh, hearing loss uh, associated with a syndrome of, of single day fevers. Just a little bit more, uh, we have here uh, an MRI of the brain of uh, a young child uh, with chronic aseptic meningitis. This is a flare image and shows uh, basically the white uh, is inflammation uh, on the meninges. Uh, this patient has a, a condition called NOMID, neonatal onset multisystem inflammatory disease. Uh, this uh, is a young man from Kansas City uh, whom we take care of at the clinical center who has uh, a syndrome in which uh, he develops pyoderma gangrenosum. Uh, that's uh, shown here. It's basically a breakdown of the skin. Uh, these patients develop a purulent uh, 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 area on the skin and bleeding. Uh, this particular lesion lasted for about a year uh, and was refractory to high doses of corticosteroids and required uh, high doses of narcotics uh, to control the pain. Uh, this is a child from Puerto Rico, a seven-year-old who has a new disorder that I'll tell you about in a few minutes, something called DIRA, deficiency of IL-1 receptor antagonist. And then finally, uh, the last image I'll show you uh, is uh, of a uh, uh, autopsy specimen of the father of uh, one of the patients that we follow at the NIH with a different recurrent fever syndrome, a fever syndrome uh, that presents with prolonged fevers, uh, uh, periorbital edema, uh, migratory rash, and abdominal pain. Unfortunately, he lived a little bit too early for the genome project uh, and passed away uh, before we started seeing his daughter. All of these patients have diseases that have basically uh, been susceptible to the uh, analysis of the genome project, and basically we have an explanation for the illness in all eight of these cases that I'm telling you about right now. And 
Luckily, uh, both for us and for the patients, we actually have treatments, targeted treatments uh, for each of these patients, uh, except for the last, of course. Uh, and uh, essentially, these targeted treatments are based on our understanding of the pathophysiology that came out of uh, the genetic studies and the fortuitous parallel universe of uh, immunology and biotechnology that developed cytokine antagonists that uh, are effective in treating these patients. So anyway, let's just talk a little bit about some of these diseases uh, in more detail. So first, we'll start with this uh, patient here, a young man, a young Armenian man that I saw at the beginning of my rheumatology fellowship here some 25 years ago. I was only five at the time. Uh, and uh, in any case, he had uh, recurrent episodes of fever and arthritis uh, that would last a few days at a time. Uh, he turned out to have familial Mediterranean fever, at least by uh, clinical diagnosis, which led us uh, to get interested uh, in uh, the positional cloning of the gene for this disease. And of course, this was back at the time uh, in the first phase, if you will, of uh, the genome project that uh, Rick uh, was referring to. Uh, and uh, certainly the paradigm of cystic fibrosis was a siren song for us. And so we uh, mapped the gene for this disease to chromosome 16 having looked actually at every other chromosome before finally uh, uh, localizing the, ca the causative uh, locus to chromosome 16, and then uh, uh, became the genome project for this area uh, of the human genome, and eventually narrowed the interval to uh, 200,000 base pair uh, interval. There were 10 genes that we uh, sifted uh, out of this region, and of course it was the 10th of the 10 uh, that turned out to have mutations associated with disease. It encodes what was then a novel uh, protein that we called pyrin, after pyrexia for fever, and a competing French group uh, uh, denoted marinostrin, they being a little bit more erudite than we, uh, after mare nostrum uh, for the, uh, the Latin for the Mediterranean Sea. In any case, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, this protein uh, in a bit. But just to uh, turn to another uh, of these diseases, this is the back, actually, of the man whose forearm uh, I showed you a few minutes ago. Uh, you can see severe, severe cystic acne uh, in his case. And we were interested uh, in this phenotype, and we were also interested at the same time uh, in proteins that interact with pyrin, the FMF protein. And by uh, basically a, uh, a comprehensive approach using yeast 2 hybrid studies, we found that one of the proteins that interacts with pyrin is this one here, PSTPIP1, proline serine threonine phosphatase interacting protein. And basically, it's a pyrin binding protein, and uh, mutations in it uh, have an effect on the avidity of binding of, of this protein to pyrin and uh, actually lead to uh, increased IL-1 secretion in peripheral blood leukocytes uh, from these patients. So we have both pyrin and a pyrin binding protein. Uh, here is another patient, uh, a young man named Jonathan, who was referred to us from North Carolina, who had a different uh, syndrome. He actually had uh, fevers, a hives-like rash, and evidence of central nervous system inflammation and overgrowth of the epiphyses of his long bones, uh, leading to this knobby knee appearance. In any case, he has mutations in not a pyrin binding protein, but a pyrin homologue. So there is actually a family of proteins that we'll talk about in a bit uh, that have an N-terminal domain that's known as the pyrin domain, not the marinostrin domain, but the pyrin domain. Uh, and actually, these proteins are involved in the regulation of inflammation. In patients who have the disease that, that he has, NOMID, neonatal onset multisystem inflammatory disease, have mutations not in the pyrin domain, but in, an, in a uh, uh, aggregation domain uh, in the middle of the protein, and actually there are other phenotypes that are also associated with this uh, as well. So we have pyrin, a pyrin binding protein, uh, a pyrin homologue, and now we'll turn to another patient who was referred to us uh, from Newfoundland, uh, Canada, who has uh, this uh, pustular rash 
all over his body. This was uh, an image taken when he was nine months old. Uh, this is actually the fold of the neck. Uh, so these are just pustules all over the back. And this patient has uh, mutations in uh, the IL-1 receptor antagonist gene. So this is a gene that's actually in that same pathway. Uh, and actually there are several other patients that we have identified uh, with other mutations in this gene, but the same phenotype leading to the uh, new disease, deficiency in IL-1 receptor antagonist. Uh, here uh, is a photo of uh, a family uh, that have yet another phenotype. This is the phenotype, actually, uh, this girl's father uh, is the one whose autopsy slides are featured on that issue of cell that I showed you a while back. Uh, she has uh, long episodes of fever uh, with cirrhosal and, and uh, joint inflammation. And patients who have this actually have mutations in another uh, inflammatory molecule, another molecule that's important in the regulation of fever in humans, and that is the P55 TNF receptor, or TNF-RSF1A. Uh, patients who have this disease, many of them have mutations at cysteine uh, residues that are involved in holding the, uh, the folding structure of the cysteine-rich domains uh, in place uh, uh, in the extracellular part of, of this protein. Uh, this is uh, yet another patient uh, who has uh, a disorder, she's from Chicago, has a disorder uh, in which the episodes of fever are shorter, uh, and they are caused, this is uh, work of a group from the Netherlands, uh, in mutations uh, uh, in mevalonate kinase, which is an enzyme that's involved in cholesterol biosynthesis. And then finally, uh, the last disease that I will at least mention uh, is Bichette's disease, which in contradistinction to the other disorders I told you about, uh, is, is a disease with complex uh, inheritance. And Bichette's disease is characterized by the triad uh, that's illustrated here, uh, oral ulceration, ocular inflammation. This is hypopion uh, uveitis. This is the accumulation of pus uh, in the anterior chamber of the eye. Uh, and genital uh, ulcerations. And so uh, we've been involved in a genome-wide association study in this disorder, and uh, basically looking at about 1,200 uh, individuals with Bichette's disease from Turkey uh, and 1,200 Turkish controls, and then confirming it uh, with uh, cohorts from Japan, Korea, and a number of other uh, areas, uh, we've found that actually uh, there is a variant of the IL-10 locus that's highly associated uh, uh, with Bichette's disease in all of these populations with a modest uh, risk, but a biological story that goes along with it. And so individuals who actually have two copies of the risk allele produce less IL-10 uh, than individuals who have uh, either one copy or who are homozygous for the non-risk allele. That's interesting because IL-10 is an anti-inflammatory cytokine, and so it actually does give some uh, account of how it is that people uh, with uh, Bichette's disease uh, might develop uh, that phenotype. So in any case, that's just a, a little overview of uh, the genetics, what we've learned in terms of, of diagnosis. What have we learned in terms of biology? Well, there's a lot more biology than what uh, I can probably talk to you about in the next two hours that uh, I have for the, for the talk, uh, so I'll try to make it brief. Uh, but in any case, it turns out that uh, pyrin itself, the first protein that I told you about, uh, which is mutated in FMF, is the prototype uh, for a domain that's found at its end terminus, which is a six alpha helix domain that at least uh, uh, oftentimes can form a dipole uh, that's involved in homotypic interaction. And so pyrin domains can interact with other pyrin domains. In the case of pyrin itself, uh, it interacts with an adapter protein called AFC, uh, which in turn can interact with caspase one uh, the enzyme that's involved in the activation of pro-IL-1 beta uh, to uh, IL-1 beta itself. And actually, uh, the pyrin domain is now uh, known to be a motif that's found in a whole large category of proteins that are involved in the regulation of inflammation and cell death. And this is just uh, a, uh, 
a phylogenetic uh, diagram that indicates some of the proteins that have pyrin domains uh, in them. Many of them are the NLRP uh, uh, family of proteins, uh, which uh, are shown here uh, with uh, the N-terminal pyrin domain shown in green. Uh, so in any case, uh, if one then thinks about the biology of a disease like FMF, we've uh, actually knocked in the mutations in the FMF gene, or at least some of them, uh, into mice. This is the work of Jay Che in our lab. And you can see that in mice that are knock-ins for the V726A uh, mutation, you may not be able to see this, but these mice actually spontaneously develop arthritis. Uh, and if one sections the joint, one sees the uh, characteristic influx of polymorphonuclear leukocytes uh, into the joint as one would see in human uh, uh, FMF. And if one breeds these mice onto IL-1 receptor knockout background, one can see that actually uh, there's a marked reduction uh, in the inflammatory phenotype uh, that these animals have. The pyrin domain proteins actually, at least one of them, NLRP3, is actually uh, an important uh, mediator uh, in a macromolecular complex that's called the inflammasome. Uh, that's involved in IL-1 beta activation. And this uh, slide just illustrates the IL-1 activation pathway and the various phenotypes that uh, we and others have seen that are associated with molecular lesions in this pathway. So that individuals who have NLRP3 mutations develop hives like rash and a spectrum of, of other inflammatory phenotypes, including CNS inflammation. Patients with FMF who have uh, mutations at another uh, point in that pathway get a different type of rash and a different duration of episodes. Patients with the hyper-IgD syndrome uh, have uh, mutations in a regulator of that pathway. Patients with the deficiency of IL-1 receptor antagonists get yet a different phenotype illustrated here with the diffuse uh, pustulosis. Patients uh, with mutations in PSTPIP1 uh, have the pyoderma gangrenosum uh, phenotype. And then, uh, hearkening back to uh, the first talk of the second part of uh, the, uh, the session here, uh, this is actually hydatidiform mole, and recurrent hydatidiform mole is actually an inflammatory condition uh, which can be associated with variants of NLRP7, uh, one of the uh, regulators of this pathway. Uh, we've also learned a lot about other uh, inflammatory disorders. So that in the case of the TNF receptor, actually we know now uh, that misfolded protein actually can form aggregates uh, in the cell, uh, which are involved in assembling a signaling uh, cascade, uh, which then lead to excessive cytokine production by leukocytes uh, from these patients. Moreover, we've gotten a much a better understanding of uh, various disorders of inflammation. And a few years ago, we had proposed a, a categorization of inflammatory or immunologically mediated diseases in which disorders uh, with autoantibody formation and antigen-specific T cells, we think of as autoimmune diseases, disorders in which these uh, uh, antigen-specific uh, variants are not present, autoantibodies or antigen-specific T cells are not present, we think of as autoinflammatory uh, diseases. And this uh, image just uh, uh, reminds uh, us of the dichotomy between the adaptive immune system uh, in which lymphocytes uh, play a major role and in which the receptors uh, somatically rearrange uh, or mutate, and the innate immune system in which the cell types uh, are for the most part myeloid uh, in nature and in which the uh, receptors do not somatically rearrange or mutate. And so basically the auto-inflammatory diseases are diseases of innate immunity. And this table here just simply illustrates that there are now lots of diseases besides the periodic fever syndromes uh, that in fact uh, fall under this auto-inflammatory rubric. And a couple of them that are much more common diseases uh, are gout, uh, in which uric acid crystals actually activate the inflammasome, uh, and this then does suggest and in fact has led to therapeutic trials of IL-1 inhibitors uh, in gout, uh, and atherosclerosis. Uh, this is uh, a paper by Ike Lotz's group from a year ago, uh, 
uh, basically demonstrating that in mouse models of atherosclerosis, that if one looks at knockouts uh, for the IL-1 pathway, that we don't see atherosclerosis in those animal models. And so atherosclerosis is probably, at least to some extent, autoinflammatory as well. We've also learned a lot about human history uh, by tracing the spread of these mutations uh, across different populations. And so here uh, is just shown the uh, spread of uh, various FMF mutations uh, in the Mediterranean basin. And in fact, there's an extraordinarily high uh, frequency of these mutations in these different populations, different mutations in different populations. The mutations cluster around what looks to be a binding pocket. Uh, in the C-terminal domain of this protein, suggesting that there probably is some sort of a selective pressure, although we don't know yet what it is. In the case of the deficiency of IL-1 receptor antagonists, uh, uh, we know that there are certain uh, areas, uh, Newfoundland, uh, the Bible Belt, Bible Belt of uh, the Netherlands, and northwestern Puerto Rico, where we sometimes see founder effects, and particularly in northwestern Puerto Rico, uh, there actually have been additional patients identified from the original propositive patients. And then finally, for Bichette's disease, uh, many of you know Bichette's disease is distributed along the Silk Route of Marco Polo, uh, going from Venice through the Middle East uh, to Korea and Japan. And in point of fact, the variants that we've seen at both IL-10 and the IL-23 receptor, which I didn't uh, talk about, they are seen both uh, in the Turkish population and in the Far Eastern population, suggesting that more than silk was traded along the silk route of Marco Polo. Uh, so in any case, then to get to, I'm sure, what uh, many are uh, uh, interested in as, as sort of the final vindication of this kind of work. We have been, we and our patients have been extraordinarily lucky in terms of uh, treatment possibilities. And as I said uh, at the outset, this is at least in part due to the fact that there has been this parallel universe of immunology and biotechnology uh, research that has been going on at the same time. So in the case of patients with NOMID, uh, the disease that's caused by mutations in NLRP3, the inflammasome uh, protein. Uh, about uh, four years ago, Rafaela Goldbach-Mansky uh, uh, in NIAMS set up a protocol to look uh, at 18 patients with this disease with anakinra, the IL-1 receptor antagonist, uh, which is basically an agent that binds to the type 1 IL-1 receptor but not to the accessory protein and thereby blocks IL-1 signaling. And one can see that uh, there is just an absolutely oops, uh, dramatic uh, uh, response to anakin treatment. This is within three days of treatment. These patients' skin rash goes away. Their ocular inflammation goes away within about three months. Uh, the uh, CNS inflammation, the chronic aseptic meningitis, is largely gone. The arrow points to the cochlea. This is cochlear inflammation, which uh, dissipates as well uh, with specific cytokine therapy. Here's a patient with GIRA, the deficiency of IL-1 receptor antagonist, with uh, pustular lesions all over uh, the body uh, at age nine months. Within three uh, days of uh, beginning treatment with uh, IL-1 inhibitor, you see that the skin is beginning to uh, slough and the child is beginning to smile rather than cry. Uh, and uh, by seven days after the initiation of treatment, you can see that nearly all of the skin uh, has sloughed, and basically this patient uh, is well as long as uh, he continues on the Anakinra injections. Uh, here is a patient, a young man from Baghdad, Iraq, who has familial Mediterranean fever. The usual treatment for that is colchicine, but he has severe amyloidosis, uh, including in his gastrointestinal tract, which leads to chronic diarrhea, so he was not able to tolerate uh, colchicine, and so instead we have put him on uh, anakinra as well. Uh, at the time that we first saw him, his ejection fraction was about 37 uh, percent, and he had chronic malabsorption, and we really didn't think that he was going to survive for very long at all. But actually, on anakinra, uh, he has done extremely well. His amyloid deposits have, at least to some extent, regressed. And five years later, uh, here's his picture after having just eaten pizza 
then finally, thinking about some of the more common uh, diseases that now have what appears to be an auto-inflammatory component, type 2 diabetes. So you might not think of diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, as having an inflammatory component. But in fact, uh, hyperglycemia induces islet cells to produce IL-1. IL-1, in turn, is toxic to islet cells, so that in fact uh, they end up producing something that causes them to commit suicide, which of course then leads to more hyperglycemia and uh, more uh, IL-1 production. And one can see that if one treats these patients uh, with uh, an IL-1 inhibitor, that in fact glycemic control uh, improves, and IL-1 inhibitors are actually now in clinical trials for type 2 diabetes. And finally, I would just end with yet another disease that I haven't talked about yet, PFAPA, the syndrome of periodic fever with aphthous stomatitis, pharyngitis, and cervical adenopathy. It's actually the most common recurrent fever syndrome in kids, and we see it quite frequently uh, in our clinic. It is uh, caused by uh, a complex set of genes that we don't yet understand, but taking a genomic approach to it and just looking at gene expression profiling, we found that, in fact, patients with PFAPA during their attacks have activation of the inflammasome pathway, the IL-1 pathway. So we have started treating a few of these patients with anakinra, and we do see a diminution of fe in fevers and, and other episodes. Just earlier this week, on Tuesday, I saw one of the patients that's in this study uh, from Tennessee who actually has taken now 20 courses of anakinra and has aborted all of his attacks uh, basically within hours. A little bit later that morning, we saw a three-year-old from Seattle whose mother had lost her job because she was having to stay home with her, her uh, daughter uh, with her attacks of fevers, and of course, we've now started uh, the daughter on Anna Kenra as well. There's a lot left to be done. Uh, this is a pie chart of some 1,300 patients that we've seen at the NIH uh, with various uh, recurrent fever syndrome syndromes, and you can see that actually we only have uh, genetic diagnosis in about 38 percent of them, and so there's lots left uh, to do. So in any case, I'll just close uh, with uh, uh, some acknowledgments to people that uh, made a big difference in terms of this work. Uh, Ivona Aksentievich, who's been the person who's done a lot of the gene discovery work in terms of sequencing in our lab. Rafaela goldbach mansky now a tenure-track uh, uh, investigator in NIAMS, who's uh, done a lot of the clinical uh, studies, Jay Che, who's developed the animal models, Seth Masters, who's done a lot of the work on functional studies, Richard Siegel, a uh, collaborator uh, who does a lot of work on the uh, cell biology of traps, and Elaine Remmers, who's headed up uh, our GWAS studies. Uh, and then um, our larger group uh, of the lab and uh, clinical people uh, shown at a recent NHGRI retreat, uh, and then finally, of course, acknowledgement to the NIH Clinical Center where all this work took place. So anyway, thanks a lot. Thank you.